I come from Motherwell, near Glasgow. I come from Belfast, Ireland. Come from Wrexham, North Wales. Liverpool, England. What happened? Well, uh, I was on an HA director, and uh, the aircraft alarm sounded off about uh, half past ten. And a reconnaissance machine was sighted astern. But nothing happened for about half an hour when uh, the Prince of Wales opened fire. It must have been about 11 o'clock then. It was 11 o'clock because the rum bugle went. But we didn't get it. Uh, a flight of bombers uh, was sighted there, and they passed overhead. And when they got away on the port side, a salvo of bombs dropped, and one of them was uh, a direct hit, right amidships. The rest straddled us. What's it like under bombard? Uh, it's a pretty empty feeling, but uh, we can do nothing about it. It's our job to keep the gun firing and keep the and bring down as many planes as possible. It's the skipper's job. He then a grand job in dodging, he dodged 19 torpedoes. There was all hell let loose. There was a lot of firing and different things all the time and, and the ship, you could tell, was motoring and, and steaming at, at a really fast speed. And then what we really needed was fresh air and somebody decided to open up the door on the port side where you could step out onto the quarter deck. And then when I went out and took advantage of the fresh air, which was marvellous compared to what was happening inside, and um, we were st then started to watch what happened because we couldn't help very much with what was going on inside because of all of our part had been evacuated. And then I stood on the quarter deck trying to gain me wits and clear my head and see what could be done. And I was so amazed, and this is the thing that's lived with me ever since, to look at the aircraft that were coming in torpedo bombing us. And they were marvellous aircraft. These aircraft came in at terrific speeds, quite, quite fast, much faster than the 90 mile an hour of the swordfish. And they were so streamlined, their pilots pressed their attacks in so strongly and there were so many of them, they dropped their torpedoes at a far higher height than ever out we'd seen Royal Navy aircraft do. And they came in and they were, uh, the only way to describe it is that they were of a different generation. And we'd never seen anything like it at all. And you can imagine our horror and, and shock when we thought we were going to have a walkover and it was all aircraft with rice paper and string and and, you know, uh, obsolete things. But here was the most modern aircraft we've ever seen. I watched them drop their torpedoes. I was standing on the port quarter deck, just by the door, and ready to get back in if anything serious happened near me. And all the guns were going off, uh, what guns there were. And, of course, I think some of the more low angles were firing at the aircraft. I could see the Prince of Wales, uh, I suppose, two or three, four, five miles away, was hove to. She wasn't doing anything, she was just standing there and we were just hanging about when we could have got away, I think. She was hardly moving and just staying there. And we kept on staying with her. She had the Admiral on board and I think probably if we could have cut and run, we might have survived. But it, it, uh, it, it's problematical. They might have caught us even at a later stage with more aircraft because one of the characteristics of the Japanese aircraft is that having dropped their torpedo, they didn't turn away. A lot of them came straight on in, uh, firing their, their cannon at us. I mean, they were quite fearless. They flew straight through these barrages. We shot down two. Well, I think it was my gun, because I, I know one most certainly was, because um, I could see our, sh our shells exploding, and I could see the fire running up the fuselage of the aircraft. It turned up about... I suppose, 50 yards on our port beam and flew up parallel with the ship and I could see every detail of the crew um, scrambling up to the forward end through the glass 
a dome on the Bomanus place. And um, that I know for certain. Um, I think that the second one, uh, which was a bit further ahead, uh, which we'd engaged from the port bow, was also um, hit by us. I don't think it was hit by anything else because uh, there was no other gun of our range on that side. I'm, I know it wasn't Prince of Wales because she wasn't close enough. And, um, and we, uh, we passed the first one, sticking with his tail sticking out of the water as we went, we went past it. Um, the other one, I don't know what happened to it, but I saw it just go in with a splash, and then I, I think it was by then that we were abandoning ship. And, and, uh, um, but several aircraft had flown straight over the ship, cannon-shelling people, and that's where the casualties came from. It now appeared that um, the ships were going to be engaged in more action than we first expected. And as we were getting short of fuel, we had a unanimous decision amongst our crew that we would head for Singapore and get as far as we could on the fuel we had because it was no good relying on the ships being able to take us back inboard again. After proceeding for five or ten minutes on course, we suddenly saw a large spout of water go up about a mile ahead of us rather startled us so we looked up and then saw that a number of Japanese planes were now approaching the ships again. It does appear probable that one of them had prematurely dropped a bomb or a torpedo on their approach. We once more turned the plane in order to view the fleet and saw the Japanese torpedo bombers going in on a run, which at first we thought was a low-level bombing run because they were coming in at quite a speed, a reasonably high altitude, and dropping their torpedoes, which was altogether different from Royal Navy training for torpedo runs. We did see a couple of the aircraft apparently being shot down because balls of fire appeared in the vicinity of the ships. It did then appear that hits had been made because the Prince of Wales was making a turn which appeared to be not fully controlled and the repulse was more or less following in her wake. It was then that we decided that once more we would make for Singapore. After the first attack on the Prince, then they started concentrating on us as well. And guns from five ships, well, it was deafening. But really, it's, it, it's hard to say at the time, but you never thought of being in action. You never thought of being scared or anything. You just got on with the job, you know. And these torpedo bombs was coming in so close you could see the pilots. You could see the pilots. You could see them releasing the torpedoes. And my my first words in the ADP to the people surrounding me was, uh, they're going to go into us, cross the aircraft. It looked very much like it. It was so close. And then, apart from that, was uh, they didn't only drop the torpedoes like, we were getting machine gunned as well. As a matter of fact, the uh, machine gunner was only a, well, I machine gun, was a uh, twin Lewis, which is up near DP where I was. He was knocked out, and I was looked out, and I said, well, his glasses is no good to me, I see them without glasses, binoculars. Then I took over on the uh, twin Lewis. And I started putting at them. What well, did you just think the bullets would just go straight through them? I mean, after all, there were only three or threes. But uh, that was from the Twin Lewis. What well, did you just think they, they would just go on through? You, you couldn't keep them away. They're just like bees round the only pot. And then uh, we did actually see two or three go into the water and down. Oh, the cheers then through the auction. Everybody was shouting and cheering. And after considerable damage had been done to the prince, we thought 
would have a respite. We thought, you know, I thought they'd gone. But they hadn't. There was a, apparently one formation had come in. Machine gunned us, released our torpedoes, and then they'd finished our torpedoes because they were only carrying one each. They'd apparently gone back and another formation was coming in. So we had to start it all over again. And it was accounted for that Captain Tennant, he evaded and dodged 19 torpedoes and it was the 20th one what hit us. Each uh, formation of aircraft came in, delivered its own attack. And, uh, and I think there were 88 all told, 88 aircraft operating. Um, and they were the Japanese first 11. I mean, they were far better than anything that we ever knew. Um, the intelligence um, uh, seems to have fallen over very much. I mean, we, we really didn't know. Certainly as a junior officer, we had no idea of the capabilities of the Japanese naval air arm. And I rather think that... Um, uh, although, again, this was known in certain instances. I mean, they knew that there were torpedo bombers. Uh, one part of the intelligence bureau knew it. The other part didn't, and it wasn't passed over. That was in Singapore. And to say that the Japanese bombers ha hadn't got the range was nonsense. They'd already been over Singapore, and they could only have flown from Indochina. So there was, you know, there was... I don't think that the... Um, I think if one was going to criticise... Uh, I don't think that the high command in uh, in Singapore was perhaps as on the ball as it should have been. They really started concentrating on repulse. Well, we were about about a mile the Prince of Wales, and then uh, we opened out. Of course, then again, there was, uh, we had the three destroyers with us. We had the Electra, uh, the Express, and the Vampire. The Vampire was an Australian destroyer. And we most like uh, formed a circle. You know, more like, you just think, we were, like in the old cavalry days with the Red Indians, formed a circle and just circling around to make ourselves as small a target as possible. And then we started drifting away from them. And uh, and as, as a matter of fact, in, well, in actual fact, two or three torpedoes which had missed the Prince of Wales was heading straight for the repulse, which was spotted by the surface lookouts. And as I said, the skillful seamanship on Captain Tennant, he avoided them. They didn't hit us. As we got out of the way and they went astern of us. You could see the tracks in broad daylight. You know, very, very plainly to be seen. The jet planes came in at us, uh, flying low. Then they dropped, they dropped their torpedoes, then come up and perhaps pass us or try and avoid us as they passed us and get a pretty good... Uh, battering from our guns but the captain was very skillful at handling ship and he managed to co what called comb the torpedoes so that they passed down either side of us and the, none of none of them hit us on on the first attack what i think uh, amazed me about that was that the gunnery wasn't at all bad and uh, we could see the uh, ACAC hitting these planes, or some of them. And I can remember one plane blown to pieces. But the, there was a shower of ACAC going through past these Jap um, torpedo bombers. But it made no difference to them. They came on. And one couldn't help um, thinking what magnificent, uh, gallant fellows they were. I've, ne I've, never fl I've never flown in a plane in an attack, so I don't know, maybe it didn't seem so bad when you're in the plane as it does when you're actually firing at them. But uh, they weren't deterred in the slightest bit by the, by the shell that was being fired at them. They came on, um, some of them quite close, and then they'd fly quite close to the ship, 
and again they'd get to the short range ECAC, um, plastering them the whole time, and one or two came down, others went, went on, but there was no sign of any fear at all, no hesitation, they came just straight on. If one hadn't realised it before, one would have realised then, one was up against something pretty tough, much more so, I would say, than, uh, for instance, the fighting against the Italians. Then they, <coughs> when the Japs uh, saw what avoiding action we were taken, after a pause, um, they came in and they came in and attacked us from two two different directions. Well, now you can, in turning to comb uh, one lot of torpedoes, of course you expose your side to another lot coming down. You can't do both. Uh, you can comb one or the other. You can try dodging, but but one or other is going to get you. And they were they knew that they were clever enough to know that, and um, that was the, that was the attack which got us, and we got I don't know something like four torpedoes hit us on the port side. This was the great thing about Pulse that right up until it was not possible, uh, everything worked. The guns fired, the broadcast system worked, everything, and it was only the fact that the captain having realised that the ship was going to sink and there was no way of stopping it. And, uh, and, so, and uh, there was nothing more to do, really. And uh, if um, 1,300 men were going to have the slightest chance of getting away, then they'd got to go and go now. And uh, that was a big decision for him to take, uh, but that was the kind of man he was. I mean, as long as there was any hope of doing anything, uh, the ship was fought to the last. Um, when it was quite clearly finished, he gave the order to abandon ship, and only just in time. Um, and I remember having a, quite a job to get rid of my gun's crew, particularly the captain of the gun, who was again locked to his gun. And I said, you know, you, you can't do any more, Davis, for God's sake, get the hell out of it, or words to that fact, I don't know what I said, but anyway. Um, and then we had to scramble up... Um, the deck round the funnels, which was the flag deck where the signalman operated from, which was polished sort of what we called quarter scene, like lino, and it was a bit um, it was a bit slippery because unfortunately uh, several men had been killed by uh, cannon fire, and um, so we had to scramble up through this, and several times one slipped slipped back on this rather gory spectacle. And uh, then we climbed down, I personally sort of climbed down the, um, the decks. There were several, there was a, the flag deck and then the, the B gun deck and uh, the, uh, down, uh, walking more or less vertically on, on a ship's side which was horizontal. Uh, the ship was then lying over in the water, still going through the water at about five or six knots. And uh, I got to the the guardrails, which normally run round the upper deck, and I, I sort of clambered through them, and then I was walking down the ship's side, and I then wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. I knew I'd got to get in the water. Uh, there were a lot of people jumping off uh, at intervals all down the ship's side, and I had time to think um, of uh, that very famous uh, World War I photograph of the German... Battlecruiser Blucher sinking at the Battle of Dogger Bank, lying on her side with all the ship's company uh, walking down the ship's side and jumping into the sea. And I thought, well, here we are. Here's the same thing. And um, I got to the I got to the bilge keel. Then I was I waited. I just waited for a gap in the water. I didn't want to jump on somebody. And of course, I was also very aware of the propellers still going round, and all this business of being chopped up by the propellers. Anyway, I finally thought, well, it's now or never, and um, took a gigantic jump into the water. Then realised how unprepared I was. I swam as hard as I could um, away from the ship to get clear of the suction and the propellers. Well, from my point of view on the bridge, um, one felt the, the thump, thumps so as the torpedo hits you. And, um, of course, they made whacking great holes in the side, which the ship couldn't take, so gradually she started to heel over to port and uh, slowed down, of course, because things like boilers were 
blown up and so on. Captain did his best to avoid it, but it was no good. The captain kept everybody at action station as long as he possibly could. I wouldn't be absolutely certain about this, but I would say that the ship was practically on her side before the last gun stopped firing. And at a very, at a very late stage, um, he gave permission to abandon the ship. And I stayed where I was on the bridge um, as she went over on her side. And um, eventually down we went. I went down in a lot of froth and bubbles. Same with the captain and anyone else who was on the bridge. And uh, I think I came up to surface and then I was sucked down again and I came up again. And uh, I found myself... Um, fairly close to a Carly raft. And I swam to that and sat on that until we were picked up by a destroyer. Well, it was quite frightening because um, you knew you were being hit and because you knew you were being hit and with us being down below, um, you... you you got the impression that, that that if this went on much longer, this tin box is going to be a tomb. You know, you, you although that was at the back of your mind, um, it it seemed to make you uh, um, less frightened, if, if that's a word. If you were frightened, I suppose we were, I was frightened. I must admit, and um, but it seemed you. You had to um, uh, uh, be calm because you didn't want to show everybody else that you were frightened. And you, you wanted to do your job because if you didn't do your job, then something might happen. So we, we, were, um, we were well under control. You know, it was showing fear. They, were all, they, they might have been a bit, a bit whiter than what they normally were, but... but um, as I say, we were all calmly doing the job that we were supposed to do. Um, the only interruptions was when we felt an explosion and a bit more dirt was coming down from the bulkhead, you know, and that sort of thing. And and um, you uh, and but that was only momentarily, I would say. The way the the corridor outside the wireless office was rather full of people moving to abandon ship, which meant that that um, we had to go up through the through the 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 uh, wireless office flat, which took us out onto B gun deck. And uh, by the time we got up to B gun deck, the ship was really hard over, and. Uh, we were able to walk off the ship into the water down the ship's side. I, I must, I must say, at that that time, the the um, the behaviour of the people were, from what I could see, was very, very good. And and um, it seemed orderly. There was no panic. There was no shouting. In fact, it was quiet. You know, well, it was quiet because the guns had stopped firing. I suppose that that gave you a sense of of it being a, a, a lot quieter than, than than what it really was. Yeah. And we just got into the water and we swam away from from the ship. And shortly after that, it went down. And. Um. A number of people, as the ship killed over, there was air vents going down into the boiler rooms and the engine rooms. And I remember people with their hands trying to pull off uh, all these wire mesh tops to let people that were coming up the vents to get out. And it was a frightening and harrowing time then doing that. A lot of them were successful. But again, it was all hell was let loose and it was still the firing and it began to dawn that we were going down 
and and uh, also that uh, uh, the Prince of Wales was going to uh, be lucky to get out of the situation. And uh, I'm glad I didn't have that life belt, but it's not a good... Uh, I was disobeying orders, really. And uh, we went slid over the side with a lot of others that were going over. And my fear was that I would be sucked under or get caught up in the propellers or any uh, suction of that type. And the ship, as it was going along, still at a fairly fast speed, um, I uh, went over the side. And as soon as I was in the water and came to the surface, I swam away from it as fast as I could go. And then I swam so fast that when I looked round, the ship had gone. When I, when I thought I'd better take a rest, and I looked round and I couldn't see the repulse. When it came for a abandoned ship, we all made our way down the ladders and through the hatches, uh, down to the deck. And by that time, I mean, she was listening badly and still sinking, and we had to be very, very careful of uh, which we were went over, either by jumping or sliding down the uh, bulkheads. I had to be very careful of that, because if she was going down, she was making a big swirl, and if you got in that swirl, she would pull you down with it. I was fortunate, really, because I got straight off. I jumped and got off, jumped into the water. I didn't slide into the water. I was fortunate if I jumped in and kept myself clear uh, to an extent but um, I had the visions. I was still under, and I had the visions of, oh my God, I'm finished. I'm fighting, like, fighting for all I was worth to get back to the surface. I must have been caught in a, in a bit of a swirl. And you would just think, all my previous life, my mother and father and all the family just flashed through my mind. Next thing I knew, I was breathing out, surf as I came up. But I'll never forget that one particular instant when I thought I was really going and the whole family flashed straight through my mind. And as I say, when we were down in the engineer's workshop, uh, we could feel the torpedoes hitting, of course four on the port side and one on the starboard and uh, the ship began to list heavily but and the act the um, order was given to abandon the ship but the tannoy system in the after end of the ship was out of action so we didn't get it so the first inclination we really had although we were going over to port was when the water started to come down the shaft down into the engineer's workshop. The hatch itself isn't very wide, about two foot wide, two foot square. And so when it started to pour down there, I suppose there was a hundred men down there, and it was obvious that they weren't all going to get out, not if the ship was sinking at any rate. And uh, But there was no panic. Everyone got into a line, and I suppose I was about the twelfth up. And when I got up the shaft, I, you come out of the shaft onto that, what they call the half deck, and I was up to my chest in water. And I managed to wade across there to the, and out onto the quarter deck, which was of course at about 50 degrees then, and crawled up the quarter deck, and then over onto the ship's side. Well, a lot of men jumped then, but as the ship was going, still going quite a speed through the water, of course they got sucked underneath. But, the remainder of us waited, and then she, when she did slow down, we jumped into the water. Uh, when the ship was sinking, we saw Captain Tennant stood on the what was the side of the signal deck, because she was over, right over on her port side, and he saluted and shouted out, Godspeed to everybody, and went down with the ship. So when eventually we knew he was picked up, we saw him with his head all bandaged. We were very pleased at, at, about that, uh, as you can imagine.
And the captain's last words were, God bless you all. I managed to get over to the starboard side of the ship, and she was listening heavily to port, and I slid down the starboard side, I just built it as well, and they acted as a kind of catapult to throw us off. We got in the water and swam around for a bit, and the destroyer picked us up, and we were taken back into port. But the bravest thing that we heard of was a chap of 16, who incidentally came from my hometown, Liverpool, who gave his life belt away to an older chap who couldn't swim. And the young chap couldn't swim either, and he got drowned. Now listen, by the way, are we downhearted? No. no.